Thank you kindly for uh, the introduction. And we're all just uh, poor, pitiful servants of the Lord Jesus. And thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, it's October in Michigan. And it also means that that's, uh, uh, I have a little venue down here that we do grape juice off of. And my kids are here uh, doing that. And they have their little doggy. And I've got my little doggy right here, which I normally don't have on Zoom. So if you hear a little bit of doggy, bark or whatever. Uh, hopefully I don't have to get up and take care of anything, but uh, you just understand ahead of time and, um, and we'll go through. But we want to focus on this wonderful, wonderful book of Galatians. It's been such a blessing to me and to, to many others. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction. So here I'll give an introduction, then we're going to get into the text itself. Now I won't go over every text because we don't have time to do that. We have six sessions together. But uh, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end of our time here together for you to ask questions. And that doesn't mean I'll always have the answers, but we'll try to work on it. Or if I don't, we'll come back and try it later, maybe the next time. But sometimes it's in the question and answer time that you're able to clarify things for people. And hopefully that'll be a blessing and a help to you. But I'm happy to join you this morning. I'm happy to share um, what the good Lord has uh, put on my heart. First thing we want to ask ourselves is who are the Galatians? And actually they had lived in what was called today Turkey, uh, Asia Minor. They had developed a province there. And eventually, of course, it became part of the Roman world and they were joined by several. But we know that there's at least four churches in the province of Galatia. They were Celtic or Celtic from uh, what we usually think of of Northern Europe, France, all that kind of an area. But they had settled there, and Paul raised up these four churches. And so when he writes this book of Galatians, he writes it to all four churches, to the Galatians. Uh, and they were pagans. We'll get into that. They had accepted the gospel, uh, and they had embraced the gospel. And now we have, this is a very early book in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And I like it for its simplicity. I love the book of Romans, too. Romans is, is more, um, it's at, toward the end of his work. and and it, it's more, what should I say, um, not logical, but it's more organized, so to speak. But um, Galatians also touches on some things that you don't see as much in the book of Romans. So um, it was uh, written to the Galatians during the Protestant Reformation. It helped to launch the gospel. The book of Galatians and what happens here actually preserves the church and preserves the gospel of the early church. Uh, without it, the early church would have split. We'll talk more about that. Um, I don't know if I get into it today, but oh, in our talks together. And it also played a big part in the reformation of bringing the gospel back after the dark ages. I believe that it will also play a large part in the end of time as people understand the gospel. Uh, for the book of Revelation, we all know very well that first angel brings the everlasting gospel. So if we don't understand the gospel, we cannot understand the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is part and part of the gospel. People sometimes have a hard time wrapping their head around that. But uh, we must understand the whole concept here. And if we understand the gospel correctly, we'll understand why the mark of the beast is the mark of the beast and why in the end of time, these issues are really not complicated. They are really, uh, the world is not going to be put through a complicated process. This is going to be a very, very clear decision that the world will have to make. And so uh, in the Protestant Reformation, the, uh, the, the Martin Luther, the great Protestant reformer, he said this about the little book of Galatians. He said, the little book of Galatians is my letter. I have betrothed it to myself. It is my wife. Uh, so it made a huge impact uh, in the Ro Reformation. Yet, you know, as we talk about the Protestant Reformation, uh, so indebted to the book of Galatians and Romans, yet these Protestants, as brilliant as they were and as wonderful as they were, they seem to have missed a great truth revealed in the book of Galatians in this letter. Now, they correctly understood the message of Galatians that a person is justified by faith in Christ plus nothing else. They understood that clearly. But what they failed to grasp, and they also understood that Jesus was the symbolic lamb of God uh, from the earthly sanctuary, that they understood. But what they did not grasp were the full implications 
of how the symbolic earthly sanctuary would be fulfilled by Jesus on earth and in the heavenly sanctuary. So in our study of Galatians, we will see that this link to the sanctuary and the gospel uh, has a profound impact on our understanding of the simple gospel of Jesus. So for the record, just let me state again, when Jesus ascended to heaven, he anointed the heavenly sanctuary to take place of the earthly sanctuary in Jerusalem. When the earthly sanctuary was anointed by Moses, it was meant only to be temporary and symbolic until the Messiah's death on the cross. The earthly sanctuary is a pattern or a copy or a shadow of the true one in heaven. Now, the book of Hebrews more clearly um, uh, gives that, make that clear, but I will, um, we'll get into that a little later, not into the book of Hebrews, but the heart of this issue is found in the book of Galatians. So if the reformers had followed this trail, which so clearly is pointed out in scripture, it would have saved countless misunderstandings about the gospel, particularly, and underline this because this is where it's going to be in the end of time, particularly the function of the law of God, in particular the Ten Commandments. Instead, um, much of the evangelical and Protestant Christianity has been sadly immersed and flippant talk about the gospel. I even hear it in Adventist, Adventist circles at times. Flippant talk about the law of God and, and so forth. Um, over and over again, we hear talk suggesting that being under grace releases us from obeying the Ten Commandments. To replace the Ten Commandments, many evangelicals have tried to invent or a modified law, saying that some parts of the moral law apply while other parts do not. Of course, this parallels the papal position, which is more bolder. They simply claim they have the power to change the law. Of course, we know the Ten Commandments are unchangeable, and that and if they were not unchangeable, Jesus would not have needed to die. And the Protestant attempt is a shameless attempt uh, to usurp. Both of these are shameless attempt to usurp the place of God. After all, as John Stott said one time, I believe it was John Stott, the laws he makes, that God makes, are the laws we break. So these convoluted positions promoted by leading, uh, leading Christian entities are embarrassing to say the least. This is the result of discounting, saying the law of God has been changed, or we have the power to change the law of God, or the law of God doesn't matter. These are embarrassing positions and it's the result of discounting the role of Christ as a high priest in the context of the heavenly sanctuary. So the real issue that Galatians addresses is this. How, does sinful, how do sinful human beings achieve the righteousness that's expressed in the Ten Commandments, which is built on the love of God? How do, we, how do we achieve that? So today, of course, um, we find that the gospel is more relevant and it's more controversial today than it was in, the, in Paul's day. On every intellectual level, I believe the gospel is moving in the modern world. We have all kinds of philosophies that they're at war with the gospel. We have the materialistic, the secular world, the agnostic humanistic world that all despise the gospel. For instance, Marxism promises utopia to the world. The fascists do something similar by insisting that their uh, control is essential to order and prosperity of society. And then add the gurus of paganism, the oligarchies, the dictators, the cliques of wealthy elite, the political parties of every strike. They all claim they have either spiritual or literal solutions to the earth's curse of decay and death. The solutions, of course, are the conditions that the populations will surrender their freedoms and trust their wisdom. Sounds like the mark of the beast, and that's what the world is getting set up for, is for that kind of thing. Today, it is very popular to put all the world's religions in the same basket. 
In this ecumenical fantasy, many religious leaders urge that there are many roads to heaven. If you follow their rituals, maxims, and rules and regulations, they promise to get you to eternal life. We can also add to that the cult of individualism. We particularly see that in the Western world. Those who see themselves as the center of the universe, these do-it-yourselfer gospel makers, so to speak, make up their own religion. They pick a little here and a little there, and they mix in whatever suits their fancy. The truth is this, that none of these combinations can fix the broken morals of the world, and these broken morals are the source of our misery, our sorrow, our decay, our death, and dying. So while human laws may compel civility and civil behavior, genuine morality cannot be repaired out from the outside. It can only be repaired by the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So this issue of the world's brokenness is at the heart and the existence of all world religions. The Jewish clergy resisted the gospel because they were afraid that it would lead to a moral breakdown. They taught that the gospel of grace would destroy human motivation to be good. We see the same idea today reflected in pagan and the philosophical religions of the world. And of course, the secularism and human t uh, humanity that, um, or humanism that swirls around us here in the West. People will not be good, they suggest, unless they are forced to earn their morality as a reward. But contrary to our dear Jewish rabbis and their allies, grace does not do away with morality. In Galatians, Paul will powerfully demonstrate that faith in Christ alone is the only way to establish righteousness and morality in a lawless world. And finally, in this introduction, the heavenly sanctuary and the high priestly ministry of Jesus are the context. Now, context is everything. You can take, if you take stuff out of context, you can make people say anything you want to say. That's what people do with the Bible. That's what they do with all kinds of things. They just, they, they make it fit themselves, but they have to take it out of context. So the context of the gospel is the sanctuary, the heavenly sanctuary and the high priestly ministry of Jesus. They are the context. Without this guiding context of the faith, uh, without this guiding context, the faith of Christians is bound to stray. And that's exactly what happened in the Dark Ages. And that's what gave us the Dark Ages. And that's why we haven't fully recuperated the gospel because much of Christianity today does not have that context. You know, they're trying to explain things without the context. So without the, prop, without the proper context, the truth becomes distorted, twisted, manipulated until error reigns in the name of truth. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's go to um, the book of Galatians. And we're going to start here, if you don't mind, with, um, with, the, with verse 1. Actually, for sake of time, I, I'll skip down to verse 3. Grace to you and peace, says the Apostle Paul. I'm using a New American Standard. I'm not sorry, uh, a New King James uh, this morning. Grace to you and peace from the God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. By the way, we might say we're still in that present evil age. This age, however, according to Jesus, is coming to an end, and there's going to be a new age, excuse me, a new age that will usher in eternal righteousness. And it's in this present evil age that we're delivered by the gospel in order to be ready for the age, that wonderful age to come. According to the will of God, our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, verse six. Yeah. Uh, he gets right. He gets right into verse six and verse seven, and uh, this is what he says. He says, "I marvel that you are turning away from Him who called you in grace to a different gospel." 
Now, Paul makes a big deal about this. Excuse me. Had to take care of the doggy here. Uh, Paul makes a big deal out of this. In verse 7, he says, you seem to be attracted to a different gospel, which is not, verse 7, another gospel. Uh, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert. That's an important word, to pervert the gospel. Can there be another gospel? No. And there's a reason why there can't be another gospel. We have only one Savior. We don't have multiple saviors. The gospel is the gospel of the Lord Jesus. This is his gospel. And so all they can do is try to pervert it. You can't, there's not two gospels. I'm not done a bunch of different gospels. The gospel is the gospel of the Lord Jesus, our one and only savior, our one and only high priest. Uh, you know, these are strong words that the apostle Paul uses in verse seven. Uh, if, you if you pervert, the pure teaching of the gospel, then the original power of the gospel is changed. Now, it reminds me of Romans, you know, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says the gospel is the power of God. That's why your early Christianity could not be stopped. Early Christianity got it, and they had power. And much of Christianity today doesn't have power. This power is, was power to transform them and the world noticed. And it was power, the Holy Spirit working through them as agents would reach out and change other people's lives. This is power. I was um, on a trip uh, to Seychelles and I was flying out of the Northeast here. And I happened to be set as we flew across uh, and we were headed into Arabia to, to change plans or whatever. I was seated by a young lady from India a uh, very nice uh, young lady, very refined, just, uh, just a very pleasant young lady. So we were sitting there talking, and she was telling me about her home. I think it's in Mumbai where she was going, and she had gone to school here in the United States, and she had also got a job in, I think it's in um, Boston, or uh, Boston or Baltimore, I forgot which one, one of the big cities there. And she uh, she was telling me, you know, about herself, her family, her husband was a very devout, devout uh, Hindu. She was more secular. Uh, she, of course, went along with him, and that was what she was, she had grown up with. And so we talked about these things, very pleasant, and uh, we're having a lovely visit. And I looked at her, and I said, do you know anything much about Christianity? Well, no, she did. I said, have you ever read the New Testament of the Bible? She said, no, never have. I've I'm kind of interested to do that. Then I looked at her and I said, you know, I said, Jesus is very powerful. And she looked at me and she turned and she said, I know. She says, I work as a social worker with some of the worst people that have been degraded by drugs, alcohol, uh, you, you you name it, and they're just uh, out there on the streets. She says, I work with these people. She said there was a young woman there that she had been working with, and she said her life was just an absolute, utter mess. And she said, you know, they were working with her, hoping to get her, trying to help her. All these things are just band-aids. Then she said to me, she said, you know what happened? No. He said, she said somehow she found about Jesus and she gave her heart to him. She said she was a total, complete transformation. She said 180 degree turn. She was telling me this like she could hardly believe it. And yet it was so wonderful and marvelous to her. I said, when you get home, I want you to get a Bible and I want you to read about the story of Jesus. She said, I will. I will. We must understand when we understand the gospel, it's power. Power to change me. And I need that change as Paul said, I die daily. I, that power to change me, but it will change the world around us. We will become channels, if you please, channels of the grace of God. So. Um, 
so without without the original integrity, that's why Paul says there's only one gospel. Without the original integrity of the gospel, then uh, that power is changed, and and so it will destroy the church. It, it becomes like you can pervert the gospel of Christ. It's like termites destroying the integrity of the wood of a house. So. Likewise, without the original integrity of the gospel, a compromised, perverted gospel message will destroy the integrity of the church and cause its fall. The biblical gospel as presented in the church in Galatians is the truth as it is in Jesus. And I do not believe the gates of hell will prevail against the church. I do not believe it will fall. It may go through some very difficult times, but it's going to triumph in the end because of the gospel. So the biblical gospel presented in Galatians is the true gospel. And since we have a perfect savior, and I'll say this sweetly, we have a perfect gospel. I say we in the context of Galatians. We, Christian church, has a perfect gospel if it embraces it. Christ is the gospel. Now, you're going to hear that theme over and over. Christ is the gospel we're not talking about theory here we are talking about theory but we're talking about a theory that results in a reality the living christ christ is the gospel this means that the gospel can only be modified or changed if the savior is changed but jesus does not change he does not he's the same yesterday today and forever Jesus authored the gospel. He put the gospel into effect on Calvary's cross. And it cannot be rewritten by anyone. Any attempt to try to rewrite the gospel will produce a counterfeit gospel, which is powerless to save. Now, let's take a look at verse 8. But if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you other than what we have preached, let him be accursed or anathema. <laughs> Again, uh, these are strong words. Why could Paul or an angel from heaven, why could they not change the gospel? Well, because as I just stated, this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus, creator of the universe with all of its magnificence. And Paul or angels may change, as noted. Christians may go astray, as noted. Theologians may embrace strange things, as noted. But Jesus never changes. He's the way, the truth, and the life. The truth cannot change. I know we live in a world er where everybody thinks truth is relevant. It's not. Now, our search for truth may be, in a sense, relevant because we're still trying to search for it sometimes. The truth itself is not relevant. It is not. It is, uh, there is a, such a thing as absolute truth. Now, we, we seek for truth in the midst of our ignorance and darkness at times, and we're still learning about truth. But truth is always truth. I mean, you may... You may have people who may believe that and may preach with all earnestness that two plus two equals seven. People may believe such a person because if they have enough charisma or enough money or popularity or charms or beauty or handsomeness or good looks or whatever else, they, they may be just taken in that two plus two is really seven. And politicians may make law. Declaring two plus two equals seven. But the fact is, it still equals four. Because two plus two equals four is the truth. Likewise, the gospel of Jesus is the truth. Let's take a look at verse nine. As we have said before, and so I say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you than that which you have received, let him be a curse. So what was the judgment for one who preached a different gospel? They're playing with their own eternal life is what they're doing. And these are strong, these strong warnings are necessary. 
um, every generation, every generation, every generation of Adventists, every generation of Baptists or Methodists or Christians or whoever they are, it seems like every generation has an itch to find or to do something new and unique to establish themselves, to invent something new. But new Christian generations dare not tamper with the gospel because the consequences are disastrous. If future generations begin to tire of the same old gospel and look around for something new, they are playing with fire. Paul urged Christians not only to understand the gospel, but to experience the gospel. This is a passionate warning that you find in verse 9. Satan today, through his agents in and out of the church, will make his attack on the gospel. And his favorite tactic is not to just kick the gospel out the window, per se. His favorite tactic is to pervert the gospel just a little bit at a time, using particularly ministers and scholars from within the church. He knows if he can change the gospel, he can destroy the power of the church to transform lives and a power, this power, he greatly is afraid of. That's why you need to always test anybody, including myself. Always test us by scripture. Scripture compared to scripture. So I want to go down now to verse 16. And I'm skipping along here just a little bit. I'm watching the time because we want to save some time for question and answers. Uh, so looking at verse 16 to 17. Uh, Paul is saying, uh, talking about himself, that, that had pleased God to separate him for the gospel. He said, to reveal his son in me. That's a powerful statement. Don't you want Jesus revealed in you? I want him revealed in me. To have Jesus revealed in us is what the gospel is all about. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately, he said, confer with flesh and blood. Now, he's getting down to a point. He wants them to understand where he got this gospel. He was not in some ivory tire, tower. He was not uh, using his great intellectual powers to figure this out. He's trying to help them understand this did not come even from the other apostles. He said, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were of apostles, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So uh, the question is, is who taught Paul there in the desert of Arabia? And we think he was out there about three years. Who taught Paul? Who was Paul a direct disciple of? And why does that put him on par with the other disciples? That's because he was taught. Jesus revealed himself on the way to Damascus. After he went through that experience, he went and he was out in Arabia, it appears, for some time, and there Jesus revealed himself again to the Apostle Paul and revealed to him the gospel. He didn't get it from John and Peter. He didn't get it from the other apostles. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to him. Paul gets his gospel directly from the Savior himself, and that's very important uh, as we get uh, into the book of Galatians. Now, it's commonly understood that Christ's ministry was about three and a half years. The apostles would have been with him most of that time. So how long was Paul's discipleship with Jesus? It appears that his discipleship with Jesus was something similar. Although Jesus is in heaven and he's revealing himself either by vision or that kind of way. So uh, let's look down um, again as we get into chapter two of the book of Galatians. And um, maybe before I do that, no, that's, that's good. Let's go right into the book of Galatians and, and let me give you just an, uh, chapter two. I'll give you a little bit of introduction into chapter two because Paul is basically in chapter one introducing himself. He's telling them, and he's going to double down on that, that he's a genuine apostle and he's giving the reasons for that. And he's telling them that the gospel he's preaching, that it's something that he got directly from Jesus himself. And then he's going to show us how he is actually in harmony with the other apostles on the gospel, that they're all in harmony together, that there's really no division between him and the apostles. 
if they are all one. We'll see that in this next next uh, chapter. But before the, I do that, let me give you just a, a little. Sorry for the doggy here. See his little friend barks out there, and then she thinks she has to bark. But let me let me go uh, just a little introduction to chapter two here. One of the never-ending plagues of the Christian church is the is the is the constant battle with false brethren. And, and we really shouldn't be surprised at this. I mean, sometimes it's disheartening. You see people that you admired and they go off on this tangent or that tangent or they start preaching something that you say, where did they come from? Where do they get that from? I don't find that in scripture. Even people in our local churches sometimes go different directions, so to speak. But we shouldn't be surprised. Jesus actually warned us that this kind of thing would work from inside the church. And this was also true for ancient Israel. Even though Moses had to contend with lies, I'm sorry, I think they're gonna call the doggy down there. Hopefully they will in just a minute. Okay. Um, even Moses had to contend with lies and half-truths of the false brethren. At one point, false brethren persuaded nearly the entire nation to stone Moses and Aaron. Now, that I'm, I'm sharing this with you because Galatians chapter 2 is going to set us up to an amazing thing that happened in the early Christian church. Uh, the, if God had not intervened, they would have chosen new leaders and believe this or not, that would have led them back to Egypt and back to slavery. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible thing. So now in our modern times, the Bible predicts a final apostasy, and the book of Revelation is symbolically called Babylon and the Mark of the Beast. Jesus prophesied that the end time decisions would be most treacherous. That's why I have a burden that we understand the simplicity of the gospel and the power of the gospel. Uh, so even though today we have the Bible readily available to many, people just, they don't study it. Let's look at, let's look at chapter two now. And I will look at verses one uh, to three. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took also Titus with me. Now, this is very important. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preached unto the gospel. So in other words, he went and he says, this is what I've been preaching. He went to Peter, J uh, uh, John, and all the other apostles. And he says, brother, this is what I've been preaching. And he says, he goes on to say, uh, uh, he says, I went up by revelation and communicated to them that the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but had pri but privately to those uh, who were of reputation, lest by any means I might run or had run in vain. This is good practice. He says, you know, I needed the brethren to, to, to either affirm or correct me. If I, I know they spent all this time with Jesus, they they were connected to Jesus as the apostles. I wanted to hear if anything I was preaching was wrong. And I, I needed to know that. Well, what a beautiful spirit Paul has, a humble spirit. It's not arrogant, even though he's had this beautiful revelation from Jesus. He's still double checking himself with the, his brothers and sisters who have, he knows are connected to Jesus. And then verse three is a very important one. Yet even Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was not compelled to be circumcised. Now, I'm not getting into circumcised right now. We'll get into that maybe in our next session tomorrow. But uh, it's very important to ask ourselves this question. Why was Titus not compelled to be, sacrificed, uh, be, to be circumcised by the apostles? Why was that not a, a, a requirement for justification? Why was that not a requirement? For the gospel why did not even the apostles require now this is evidence that the apostles and paul were on the same same page this is a, a, a little bit of very important evidence titus was a gospel minister under paul's leadership but when he he not only titus not only preached the gospel but he organized churches and ordained elders over those churches. If the apostles believed that in addition to one's faith in Christ, circumcision, or we might add anything else, we'll talk more about that later, 
circumcision was necessary for justification, they would have certainly insisted on this Gentile Greek gospel preacher, Titus, they would have insisted that he be circumcised. But they did not. This is proof that the apostles and Paul had the same understanding of the gospel. So Paul uses Titus as example number one, that these Judaizers who had come to the Galatians from Jerusalem, they were Christian, so to speak. They were Christians, but they were coming to the Galatians saying, look, you know, I know Paul preached the gospel, but you really can't be justified unless you are first circumcised. And of course, they would add to that, as we'll see many other things. But this is proof that the apostles and the apostle Paul were all on the same page. They said, no, it, this is not necessary. And it's not necessary for Pi, uh, Titus to be circumcised, this gospel Gentile help preacher now let's let's look at verse four because it's important that we understand verse four too and this occurred because false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty we talk a lot about liberty here what that means not today but as we get into it which we have in christ jesus that they might bring us into bondage verse five whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. If you Galatians, we want the truth of the gospel. We didn't, we didn't submit to these Judaizers. We didn't submit to their teachings, not even for an hour. Now, we might ask a question. Why would, be, why would forcing, the, uh, forcing Gentiles to become circumcised destroy Christian liberty? Why, how would that do that? Well, here in this context, Christian liberty means freedom from observing Jewish temple rituals or performing any human works as a means for justification. But let's take a look at circumcision. This was, a, this was considered to be the real sign of being a Jew. Now, I, I'm going to tell you really quickly, you know, that's, I won't be too hard on these Judaizers from one standpoint. Because the early Christian church, you got to realize all these people, the temple was still functioning. Uh, sacrifices were still going on. Uh, they had grown up this way. For them, I'm sorry. For them, uh, this was, this was just, they, could, they, had, they had a struggle trying to separate themselves from a false understanding of their temple and services. So it, it was a struggle for them. So they no doubt were sincere. The sincerity doesn't make it right. So by uh, so in this context, Christian liberty means freedom from observing Jewish temple rituals or performing any human works as a means for justification. But let's take a look at circumcision for a minute. This was considered the real sign of being Jewish. Jewish converts were circumcised. Jewish parents without fail would have their sons circumcised on the eighth day after birth. Otherwise, one was not considered a Jew. Circumcision originated with God, and God told Abraham to circumcise every male in his house. By requiring Abraham and his family to be circumcised, God was giving him and his descendants a constant reminder of the gospel. Like Abraham, the Jews could succeed, and I want to say this clearly, could succeed only by putting their absolute faith in God. This faith is the foundation of the gospel. Unlike the rest of the world, they were to be a people who trusted their God supremely. However, in practicing Abraham's faith, their natural hearts, like his, would need to be cut off from selfishness and faithlessness. It was Moses who later, later said to uh, the men of Israel, the people of Israel, in Deuteronomy 10, 16, he says, therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be not stiff-necked any longer. In other words, don't be faithless. 
any longer. The symbol Moses was saying to them will not save you. And if you exhibit a stubborn lack of trust and faith in God, um, this is going to be your ruin. This circumcision, circumcision of their stiff neck, stubborn nature, their faithless nature was necessary in order for God to reveal himself as a living power in Israel for the rest of the world. Maybe um, that's a good place to, to stop and we'll pick up there tomorrow. We'll pick that up tomorrow. But just let me say this, uh, and I'm going to open that now for some questions and answers. The gospel of Jesus has power, power to cut off this old carnal nature and to render it powerless. It's still there, but it's rendered powerless. It's the gospel that circumcises our hearts. And, and the Jewish people had put their faith in the physical sign, which was no longer needed because Jesus had become the one who was cut off for Israel so that he had, would have the power in the morning of the resurrection to instill in them a new power, his own power. I'll talk more about that tomorrow as we pick up. But uh, Brother Samuel, I'll turn it back over to you and I'll let you uh, monitor the questions uh, that people may have. Thank you. Maybe uh, while we're just waiting here for just a minute, I'll just, uh, and just interrupt me when a question comes in. Um, I kind of, kind of stopped here in the middle of, um, of a thought. And I thought maybe I'll just share this with you. But again, just stop me if a question comes in. Um, one, may, one may ask why God chose the male reproductive organ for the symbol. Even though it was the fountain of physical life for the next generation, it was covered by a foreskin. When the foreskin was cut off or circumcised, this organ of life was uncovered and revealed. As the leader of his home, the husband was to be a fountain of life by giving spiritual leadership to the next generation. Just as he gave physical life to his children, so he was to give them spiritual life. Only if his faithlessness, his stubbornness, carnal nature was removed, could he impart spiritual life to his children. Otherwise, his sinful lack of trust in God would keep covered the truth that the children's real life, his children's real life, depended on their faith in God alone. Like Abraham, the faith of the father in God alone was the real fountain of life for his children. Our sinful, selfish nature, which we inherited from our ancestors, is a big problem. It restricts and it covers our natural desire to have faith in God. Our natural selfishness wars against the natural goodness and our trust in God. When Christ came as a human, he took our carnal, selfish nature to Calvary's cross. By dying our death for us, he cut off or circumcised the selfish nature of the human race. Yet, Jesus never sinned by, uh, by yielding to temptation, to the temptation of our carnal human nature. So when Jesus was resurrected, our old nature was cut off at Calvary, was forever gone. It was not resurrected. If we put our faith in him, our life will be united to him. When we repent of our sins and are justified by his grace, something wonderful happens to us. By means of the Holy Spirit and his mighty power, God spiritually will cut off our selfish nature from controlling us. While it will still be present, it has been put out of business of ruling our lives. It is spiritually dead. The death of the selfish nature and the resurrection of the spiritual nature has profound results. This change in our hearts by the Spirit of God is the guarantee that when we die, literally, we will come back on the morning of the resurrection. And since now we are united to Christ by faith, we will also share in his resurrection then. This means our symbolic foreskin or selfish nature will be left in the grave. Our sins 
with our sins forgiven, our selfish nature no longer covering us, we will be gloriously revealed with Jesus to the universe. You can cross-reference Romans 8, um, 18 to 19. So the ritual circumcision had become ingrained in Jewish thinking, but its meaning had been changed. In Jesus' day, it was a sure symbol of Jewish nationalism, along with the arrogant boasting that went with it. No longer was it a symbol of a person's faith. That is the reason why the church met in Jerusalem in Acts 15. This council set the church on a scriptural foundation of justification by faith alone. Any other position were to destroy the church in its infancy. Uh, thank you. I, I should have finished that before I stopped, but I, I wanted to finish that so that you could get the whole picture on the circumcision issue. Okay, I'll go back to you. Any questions that you might have? Thank you. 